So we will be recording the presentation and it will be available on DDAP's website um, by the end of next week, uh, potentially early the week following, but hopefully by next Friday. The slide deck will also be available on DDAP's website if you know any colleagues um, that did not have the opportunity to join the uh, live presentations um, that were delivered throughout this week. Let me introduce myself. My name is Kathy Jo Stentz, and I am the Section Chief of DDAP System Transformation Projects Unit, and I am also the lead for the transition and alignment to the ASAM criteria. I would like to welcome you to this presentation on aligning residential services to the ASAM criteria. Um, Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Um, I would like everyone to please mute your phones. This is not an interactive presentation, um, so please mute your phones or your computer audio. And we are asking that you please sign in using the chat. So I will be the only voice um, or sound that should be heard, and we thank you for that so that um, we have good facilitation and that everyone can hear what is being presented. So thank you. Um, if you are joined by phone um, and cannot let us know who you are as an attendee uh, by the chat, we will be giving an email address later that you can let us know you attended um, via the email. So um, we do have, uh, the presentation does include both audio and visual, and in order to access the slides, you must join this presentation by the specific Skype link that corresponds to this WebEx on the presentation schedule. If you don't have the schedule, you can access that by going to the DDAP website located at www.ddap.pa.gov using the For Professionals tab and then navigating to the ASAM transition page. The presentation that um, we've prepared for you today provides an overview of the documents that DDAP recently released on the 3.0 residential and inpatient services. Each level of care, that is 3.1, 3.5, and 3.7, has two documents or parts, the residential services by service characteristics and a self-assessment checklist. Please note that the presentation does not include the 3.3 level of care, or discussion about withdrawal management, which will be covered in a standalone presentation. Additionally, work is still underway regarding co occurring capable and enhanced services, and although some minimal discussion is included in this presentation, um, additional information will be addressed at a later time. If you do not have the documents that are referenced, um, on the screen or that I've mentioned, the, the service characteristics, the checklist, and the Pennsylvania addendum, I would suggest that you go to the DDAP website and obtain it uh, for your use now because we will be doing a high-level overview of them as we go through the presentation today. So each of the service description documents is an abridged resource of the information presented in the ACM Criteria 2013 text. And the self-assessment checklist will assist providers in self-gauging where they are at in the alignment process. These documents are a resource for service alignment. However, they should in no way be a substitute for completion of approved training on the ACM Criteria or having a thorough awareness and use of the ASAM criteria text. So because there's a lot to cover in this presentation, we are not going to be entertaining questions um, today during the presentation um, uh, regarding the presentation itself or the documents. 
Rather, we're asking that you submit your questions through email to ra-daasam at pa.gov, and that email address will be listed again on a slide later in the presentation. But again, for those of you who are on the phone, it's ra-daasam at pa.gov. We will be receiving those questions between now and uh, July 20th, and we will address those through subsequent WebEx sessions that will be held on July 27th and July 28th, and through a written FAQ that will be posted on DDAP's website. As a side note, while the various documents for each of the levels of care are being disseminated separately, all of them will eventually be combined for ease of reference, including the originally published guidance document and any changes that have been made along the way. And we're going to combine them into a single final document. Um, but for now, all of the ACM resources relative to Pennsylvania are located on the DDAP website. So as a review of what we've done so far uh, regarding the transition uh, to the ASAM criteria, efforts have been underway over the last several years to transition and align with the criteria in support of Pennsylvania's implementation of its 1115 waiver, also for moving toward an evidence-based practice assessment and service delivery, and for overall system-wide improvements. Uh, many trainings have occurred during this time frame, with over 8,700 individuals completing the two-day in-person ACM criteria skill building training, with additional individuals taking the change companies online ACM trainings that was approved in January. Guidance documents have been published and released on various occasions, FAQs have been posted, and residential providers have participated in a preliminary level of care designation survey. While agencies have been trained and have been required to use the criteria for level of care assessment, as a whole, we have not directed the official alignment of service delivery to coincide with the criteria. We are now ready to move our system toward, forward with the alignment of service delivery with the ACM criteria, which takes us to next steps. Over the next several months, DDAP and DHS will be working to support service providers and payers in aligning the delivery of services as described in the ACM criteria with our system of care. This will include a focus on setting, supports, staff, therapies, assessment and treatment planning, as well as documentation. DDAP will provide the documents referenced that specifically cover each of these areas for every level of care. We will also be doing these presentations for every clinical level of care in the continuum to supplement the resource documents as we progress through the rollout. Providers should begin working towards alignment in the various areas identified in each document immediately, but incrementally as needed to appropriately address each item. DDAP will be posting a timeline for anticipated progress of alignment with the criteria moving forward but these will occur at planned intervals to assist providers in making the adaptations necessary. Watch for the timeline to be posted to the DDAP website in the upcoming weeks. Foundational to the alignment process is understanding that the licensing requirements for each level of care are minimum standards for operation. A provider cannot operate as a drug and alcohol facility without a license. Alignment with the ACM criteria is an expectation of quality, 
required as a contracted provider receiving state or federal funds through the SCA or Medicaid. That goes beyond the minimum licensing requirement. A provider will not be able to hold a contract to receive public funds without aligning to the ASAM criteria. As stated very early on in the move to using the ACM criteria, doing such was both an event and a process. There was a date by which all assessments, continued stays, and discharges completed were to be done using the ACM criteria. This has been accomplished and assessors and clinicians have become familiar with the criteria over the past year or so. Now we are ready to proceed with aligning with aligning our services to the descriptions as outlined by the criteria. What we <coughs> excuse me. While we will have target dates for completion of certain aspects of this alignment, not everything will be done at once. In some areas, we will ease our system into a particular expectation. In other areas where compliance will not be as difficult to manage or is actually mostly occurring, the expectation will be that it will occur more readily. In all cases, DDAP and DHS will make every effort to support our provider network in aligning with the criteria as we believe in the importance of working together to improve our system and to deliver an even higher quality of service than we have been accustomed to in the past. Hopefully, if you did not already have the documents in hand, you have them now. And this slide shows you a very miniature version of what we're referencing. Let me point out that each of the documents has a similar layout that corresponds with how the information appears in the ASAM text, flowing through settings, support systems, staff, therapies, assessment and treatment plan review, and documentation. While each level of care has the same categories of services and even many overlapping requirements, of course, distinguishing criteria exist for each level of care. As you work to bring your program into alignment, you will want to use these documents in tandem with the ACM criteria text to fill in any gaps. The self-assessment document and the Pennsylvania expectation addendum will be especially helpful in aligning your programs to the criteria. I will highlight some of the requirements as we go through this presentation today, but not all of them. So be sure to familiarize yourself with these resources that DDAP has provided. So let's begin with the level 3.1, clinically managed low intensity residential services by service characteristics. As outlined in the Pennsylvania guidance for applying the ASAM criteria 2013, originally published by DDAP in May 2018 and revised and edited in August and September 2019 respectively, the setting for 3.1 services in Pennsylvania is a clinically licensed drug and alcohol halfway house. Halfway houses are primarily family-like or live-in, go-out dwellings licensed by DDAP's Program Licensure Division under the 709 regulations with a specific halfway house designation issued by DDAP's Treatment Division. Supports identified for the 3.1 level of care are those services that should be readily available by program staff or as an adjunct to those delivered directly to meet the needs of the individual. As indicated on the slide, examples of these services include physician access, affiliation with other levels of care, pharmacotherapy, and case management services. In order to demonstrate the existence of these affiliations or accessibility, 
Provider relationships should be formalized through MOUs, letters of agreement, etc. With regard to staffing, in moving from minimum licensing requirements to quality standards, having staff who not only meet minimum education and training, but who are also credentialed is required for ACM alignment. In Pennsylvania, professional licensure or those certifications issued by the Pennsylvania Certification Board, also known as PCB, applicable to the assigned duties of the staff will meet this quality standard. Any staff hired before July 1, 2021 will not be required to meet this expectation. Any new hires would need to be licensed or appropriately certified or working toward licensure or certification from PCB. Since this information applies to all levels of care, Details are included in the addendum document, which we will review in more detail later on in the presentation. As has always been the expectation, ongoing adequate and appropriate training directly related to the population and services delivered remains imperative. For example, all members of the multidisciplinary team working in a women's and children's facility should have training on the unique clinical needs of women. Those serving adolescents should have specific training and education regarding adolescents. Those serving veterans should know about the needs unique to, to that population, etc. These areas of specialty should be noted on the individualized training plan of the staff and a record of completed population or service specific trainings should be maintained. Since evidence-based programs and interventions are foundational to the delivery of quality care, training records should include those EBPs or therapies that are embraced by and routinely provided at the facility by all relevant staff. All clinical staff should have a foundational knowledge of motivational interviewing and the stages of change since assessing readiness or stage of change is foundational to applying the ASAM criteria. Moving forward, there will be an expectation that clinical staff be able to demonstrate proficiency with motivational enhancement and engagement strategies appropriate to an individual stage of readiness to change. Specific guidance on this training item is also in the addendum document. And again, we'll discuss this more in a bit. In most instances, the medical and mental health members of the treatment team at a level 3.1 will exist through affiliation and coordination. Paramount to alignment of therapies with the ACM criteria is that services and interventions be individualized rather than program driven. Individual and group therapies must address the specific needs of each individual as identified through the initial six dimensional assessment and reassessment during treatment. The delivery of evidence-based programs and interventions is foundational to the provision of quality care. While educational efforts will be a part of care, clinical interventions should be therapeutic in nature and not primarily curriculum or educationally based. For example, but not limited to, the delivery of therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy rational emotive therapy, EMDT, etc., should be delivered within the therapeutic setting. Because substance use disorder impacts the family as a unit, services and counseling with family members is required as appropriate, beyond educational sessions that may be required for visitation. If counseling for family members cannot be delivered by the facility, this would be accomplished through affiliation with 
and referral of the family member to another facility. Client counselor ratios for caseload as identified in Pennsylvania regulations remain in effect. Individuals cannot be denied services based upon their use of FDA approved medications to treat substance use disorders and pharmacotherapies which are considered best in evidence-based practice should be available directly or by referral or coordinated services. While a provider doesn't have to accept individuals on all forms of MAT, that provider wouldn't be eligible to receive substance abuse block grant or SOAR grant funding for any service. And the SCA would have to ensure that the individual is able to receive the needed services from another provider in the SCA's provider network. The requirement for pharmacotherapy is consistent across all levels of care. Halfway house providers and other levels of care should have affiliations with MAT providers and be able to support this necessary aspect of treatment. Level of care assessment must be conducted independently from the provider who is delivering the treatment or there must be evidence of neutrality if done by the treating provider. While an initial assessment using the ASAM criteria will assist in accurate and appropriate placement for services, both in regard to the needed level of care and the best provider match, assessment must be ongoing throughout the clinical process as strengths and needs will change over the course of treatment. The most imminent needs, having the highest risk, should be addressed first. If any biomedical issues are identified during the initial or ongoing assessment, referral for appropriate physical exam and medical services must occur. This does not mean that upon discovery of a medical condition, an individual will automatically become ineligible for the 3.1 level of care. It may just mean that concurrent medical services may be needed. For example, an individual may need to be treated for high blood pressure or dental concerns while engaged in the 3.1 level of care. Assessment is an ongoing clinical process. While state regulations provide minimum guidelines for licensing compliance, there are, these are minimum standards. If the treatment plan is adequately reflecting the ongoing assessment and both are being used as a regular compass for, treatment, for the treatment process, updates will likely need to occur much more frequently than indicated by regulation and as reflected by the ASAM criteria. Provider policy and procedure and client charts will need to reflect this alignment. With regard to documentation, as has always been expected, progress notes should reflect the treatment plan and any necessary updates. Notes should be written in such a way to demonstrate what an individual has accomplished clinically and where the therapeutic process needs to continue to go. Documentation should be timely in order to be as accurate as possible. So we have just gone through a high level overview of the service description document. However, I will state again that providers should familiarize themselves with the document overall and use it in tandem with the ASAM text. By going through the service description document and understanding the broader service description categories, providers will then be ready to utilize the corresponding self-assessment document which we will briefly review next. The self-assessment checklist has been created to help a provider determine if they comply with ASAM criteria alignment or to identify what areas must be worked on in order to fully align with the criteria. All elements in each section of the document must be evidenced by a provider in order to fully align with the ACM criteria. The good news is that many of the elements in the checklist 
are likely already being done. In addition to the self-assessment, as we proceed with service alignment at the state level, there will be a monitoring process in place to affirm the self-assessment process. So looking at the blue square on page one of the self-assessment checklist covering the setting characteristic, a provider would read through each numbered item in the block and put a check mark in the corresponding red circle to indicate that this element already exists in the program. Those items or red circles that remain unchecked will need to be addressed in order for the program to be fully aligned with the ASAM criteria. Similar blue blocks with the required elements for each of the other characteristics are on the following pages of the document and include support systems, staff, therapies, assessment and treatment plan review, and documentation. This gives a provider a mechanism to determine where they are in the process of alignment and what remains to be done in their alignment process. And again, providers are encouraged to begin this process immediately so that everything doesn't wait until the last minute and you have time to work at an even pace to begin your alignment process. DDAP will be available to assist with questions related to criteria alignment and to provide technical assistance when necessary. It is our hope that both documents used in tandem, the service description document and the self-assessment checklist, will make the alignment process easier for providers. And as stated earlier, we will have a corresponding timeline for compliance regarding the various elements of alignment. So as we move on to 3.5 and 3.7, I want to remind you that this discussion does not include withdrawal management. Withdrawal management will be presented as a separate topic in specifically designated documents and WebEx presentations that are not on the rollout schedule yet. The dates and information for these presentations will be announced at a future time. So regarding the 3.5 level of care, services identified in the Pennsylvania licensing regulation as inpatient non-hospital crosswalks with those identified in the ASAM criteria as clinically managed, high intensity residential services. Since specifically delineated healthcare staff are not required per the regulations, the ASAM nomenclature of clinically managed more accurately aligns with the title clinically managed high intensity residential services than the previously used medically monitored terminology. Pennsylvania regulations do not separate out requirements for rehabilitative and habilitative services. Residential programs are not licensed to deliver services for a specified time frame. Even those that historically were called short-term or long-term facilities. The important thing is that individuals receive the length of stay and types of interventions and intensity of services warranted. In other words, programs have never been licensed as short or long-term facilities. Just as regulations do not distinguish between rehabilitative and habilitative services, the same is true with the ASAM criteria. Both intensities of service may be delivered within the 3.5 level of care. This is discussed in the ASAM Criteria 2013 text in greater detail on pages 244 through 246. So with this in mind, DDAP and DHS made the announcement in January of this year to align with the criteria by referencing rehabilitative 
and habilitative services under a single 3.5 identifier. Admission to this level of care must be determined by the six-dimensional assessment where the length of stay is determined by the treatment plan. In specialty programs where the length of stay is known to be extended, such as in the case with women with children's programs, referrals should continue to be made based upon the six-dimensional assessment and determination for that type of specialty service with reference to special populations, both in the ACM criteria text, beginning on page 318, as well as the Pennsylvania guidance document, pages 15 through 16. Since this level of care um, and types of interventions needed are determined by assessment, services should be tailored to meet the needs of the individual rather than be set in program established curriculums and cycles of care. Reassessment must be an ongoing process throughout treatment to ensure the highest priority needs of an individual are identified and being met by the treatment plan and therapeutic interventions. The initial and ongoing assessment process should indicate an individual's rehabilitative or habilitative needs at placement or soon thereafter. Typically, traditional long-term facilities should be part of the referral process up front or very early on, not at discharge. SCAs and assessors should be very familiar with their network of contracted providers who delivers what types of services to make the most appropriate referrals to particular providers as determined by the level of care assessment. We have had questions how we will move forward with billing codes. Since the previous options for short-term and long-term residential pl placements remain in the medical assistance system, DHS and DDAP are working together to make these adjustments to the billing codes and will inform the field as soon as these adjustments have been made. Otherwise, as previously stated, while an individual's length of stay should vary, the dose and intensity of care delivered should be appropriate to the need determined by the individual assessment and not by the program type to which they are referred. The physical settings as they have historically existed remain the settings for the 3.5 level of care. While there will no longer be a distinction between rehabilitative or habilitative coding, that does not mean that distinct providers are being eliminated. For those individuals requiring habilitative care from the onset of admission, as indicated by conditions noted in the special population section of the guidance document, as has always been the case, an appropriate referral should occur. However, it should be noted that providers must be prepared to deliver individualized therapeutic strategies to address the habilitative needs rather than recycling patients through repeated programmatic cycles after periods of time. The admission requirements for the 3.5 level of care indicate that any medical conditions that an individual may have do not warrant 24-hour nursing care, but rather can be monitored by program staff or addressed through another provider. Medications can be self-administered or monitored by program staff. A residential program that does employ medical staff is not disqualified as a 3.5. It just is not serving severe medical needs. A 3.5 program that employs medical staff is also not automatically a provider of 3.7 level of care and services. Such issues are determined by
by the medical services needed by an individual and the capacity of a program to consistently provide those services. Some additional supports that should be present in a 3.5 level of care include affiliations with other levels of care, emergency services, and those ancillary services required by licensure. In many instances, case management services have been seen as an adjunct to outpatient services. However, in aligning with the ACM criteria, case management services should be reflected in the treatment plan and be delivered while the individual is in residential care. Coordination and integration of services is necessary at any level of care and residential treatment should not be a hiatus for this supportive service. Similar to what was discussed for 3.1 level of care, there will be a new credentialing requirement and aligning to the ACM criteria and staff would be expected to have the appropriate training commensurate with the population served and the therapies being provided. Such training should be reflected in training plans and records maintained on each staff at the facility. As with all levels of care, alignment with the ACM criteria 2013 requires services to be individualized rather than program driven. Individual and group therapies must address the specific needs of each individual as identified through the initial six dimensional assessment and reassessment during treatment. The treatment plan must be reflective of the strengths and needs identified for each individual and progress notes must reflect progress or lack thereof on the treatment plan. Patients should have a copy of their current treatment plan and it should be actively used as a resource or roadmap during each individual and group session and to assess progress. Providers should be able to deliver outcome-based therapies and best practices evidence to meet the identified need by clinicians who are appropriately trained in the particular protocol or intervention. Because substance use disorder impacts the family as a unit, again, services with and counseling with family members is required whenever possible, beyond educational sessions that may be required for visitation. If counseling specifically for family members cannot be delivered, by the 3.5 facility, this should be delivered by affiliation and referral. Overall, clinical services should be between six and eight hours per day, including weekends, with at least two two-hour group therapy sessions per day. Additional details about these requirements are noted in the Pennsylvania-specific expectations addendum document. As previously stated, an individual cannot be denied access to pharmacotherapy and whenever possible, coordinated efforts should occur to allow for continuity of care for an individual who is on an FDA approved pharmacotherapy while engaged in residential services. Individualization of treatment plans must occur across all levels of care, be prioritized by risk, and focus on the strengths, needs, and preferences of the individual. Documentation, such as progress notes and case consultation notes, should also be individualized and reflective of the treatment plan and indicate any necessary updates to the treatment plan. So moving on to the 3.5 self-assessment checklist, you'll find that it's very similar to the 3.1 level of care checklist. Um, it includes the elements for alignment, including setting, support systems, staff therapies, assessment and treatment plan review, and documentation. Again, the checklist for each level of care allows every provider an opportunity to self-gauge where they are at in the process of aligning to the criteria. So as a provider, you would go through each section of the checklist, check off things that are already in place 
or things that need to be done by the appropriate timeline that it would be required to be met. So um, you would do this, and again, there will be a monitoring process in place to affirm this self-assessment process. Moving on to the 3.7 medically monitored level of care, Pennsylvania's substance use treatment system has long used the term medically monitored when referring to residential services. In fact, every residential provider that was not hospital-based was characterized under the medically monitored residential heading. Therefore, that part of the terminology is familiar. What is different is the addition of the word intensive, medically monitored intensive inpatient services. The distinction with this level of care is the intensity of the patient's biomedical or emotional, behavioral, or cognitive conditions and complications and the type of services warranted to meet those intensive needs. Last year, DDAP and DHS engaged residential providers in a self-designation survey to determine which providers had the base level of staffing necessary to provide the 3.7 level of care. This resulted in a preliminary designation that now must be confirmed by both the provider, DDAP and DHS, and public payers to ensure that the facilities not only have the necessary staffing, but that the necessary intensity of medical or psychiatric services are being delivered at the level of care. Medical for 3.7 PH or physical health or psychiatric for 3.7 MH or mental health level of care. To put this another way, simply having the medical staffing does not automatically make a provider a deliverer of 3.7 medical services. Therefore, there are some providers who were issued the preliminary designation of 3.7 who will not maintain it based upon the capacity or willingness to deliver more intense medical services to individuals in need of them. We will discuss this in greater detail as we move through each of the 3.7 service characteristics. Residential programs with any of the licenses 709, 710, 711 could potentially be a setting in which this type of service is delivered as long as the necessary staff and interventions can be provided. Facilities that are a 3.7 mental health, MH, must also be licensed as a mental health provider, so they need to be duly licensed. With that being said, it may be more helpful to discuss what individual needs would best be addressed at the 3.7 level of care. Specifically, the 3.7 setting is for individuals whose medical or mental health conditions require 24-hour nursing, medical monitor monitoring and physician oversight of the treatment process, and or mental health professional involvement, but who do not need the full resources of an acute care hospital. I'm going to repeat that. Folks needing 3.7 require 24-hour nursing, medical monitoring, and physician oversight of the treatment process or mental health professional involvement, but do not need the full resources of an acute care hospital. Each of the individuals or circumstances that may require this level of care include, but are not limited to, individuals who may need wound care and packing, someone who has a Foley catheter or feeding tube that may need attention, or someone who has oxygen, someone who is on oxygen, 
additional examples of potential types of biomedical conditions likely to be treated at the 3.7 level of care are included in the addendum document. However, I would like to put out a word of caution, even about the addendum document. Those conditions noted in the addendum document are there for example purposes only. It's not an all-inclusive list. So really, um, it would be those things warranted as a necessity by a as needing 24-hour nursing care and physician oversight, but not needing acute hospital care. So a provider with the 3.7 designation should be equipped to deal with these and other medical needs in general and not discriminate or restrict admissions by condition. As indicated by these examples, there is an immediate ongoing need for professional medical monitoring and oversight and not simply the existence of a medical diagnosis. Someone could have well-controlled diabetes or asthma and not need the 3.7 level of care. The diagnosis alone of HIV positive does not warrant a 3.7 level of care. In fact, individuals who have a medical condition that is stable do not need this level of care regardless of the diagnosis. The need for medication alone, self or staff administered, is likely not an indicator of the need for 3.7 level of care. In the same regard, Someone who is admitted to a 3.5 level of care who has a stable medical condition that requires some medical attention but not 24-hour nursing monitoring would not bump up to 3.7. Providers should be aware that adjunct medical services provided directly or by affiliation are required at every level of care, even outpatient either by either directly by facility staff or through adjunct service and services and MOUs and referrals. The factor that creates the need for 3.7 level of care is the intensity of the condition and the intensity of the medical services required by each individual and specifically a medical necessity for active 24 hour nursing care. DDAP and DHS will be providing additional guidance on the co-occurring services, again, at a later time, including those that would be present or necessary for 3.7. A 3.7 level of care must have physician assessment and monitoring, 24-hour nursing care and medical specialty consultation and lab services, et cetera, as well as 24-hour mental health professional intervention in a 3.7 mental health facility. And because the 3.7 level of care specifically treats patients whose subacute biomedical and emotional, behavioral, and cognitive problems and the needs in these dimensions are so severe that they require inpatient treatment, a physical exam is necessary for every person being admitted to this level of care. The key to staffing at the 3.7 level of care is physicians who actively oversee the treatment process, not just a medical director signing off on treatment plans, but someone who's actively engaged in the treatment process. Of course, you've heard me say it several times now, the 24-hour nursing staff, mental health professionals for those that are 3.7 mental health facilities, as well as the credentialed clinical staff, that is licensed or holding a PCB certification relative to the level of work being performed. The therapies delivered at this level of care will need to focus on stabilization of the acute needs in dimensions one, two, and three. Substance use disorder specific interventions must be delivered via a daily schedule through individual and group therapies. Similar to the 3.5 level of care, this should occur between six to eight hours per day, including weekends. Delivered through two, at least two, two-hour groups per day. 
Individualized treatment planning is required, as are the use of evidence-based programs and interventions, including case management and services to family members. Again, in order to deliver individualized person-centered care, it is necessary for staff to be knowledgeable in motivational interviewing and how to apply the stages of change. Staff training plans should be applicable to the services delivered and needs addressed. Since this level of care specifically addresses comorbid medical concerns or comorbid mental health symptoms, the treatment plan should, incur, should include goals to address and stabilize the medical conditions or, or psychiatric conditions. Medical assessments include both a physical exam and a comprehensive nurse assessment. Medical assessments will need to continue throughout the patient's stay, not just in upon admission, and treatment planning should be individualized and done in collaboration with the patient. Case management should be an integral part of the treatment planning. Documentation must be reflective of all services delivered at this level of care. Medical and substance use disorder assessment and progress should be a part of a unified patient record, not split medical and SUD records, but a unified record. So many residential programs who were given a preliminary designation as a 3.7 provider may be wondering what the next steps are in more definitively establishing themselves as this type of provider. Simply stated, each provider will need to complete the self-assessment for the 3.7 level of care in light of the expectations and clarifications outlined in this presentation and the supporting documents provided by DDAP, including the addendum document, and determine the following. Number one, in addition to having the necessary staff, does your facility or program align with the self-assessment for the 3.7 service description? Number two, if you do not fully align, are you willing to become aligned with the self-assessment and the expectations for delivering this level of care by July 1st, 2021 and beyond? And number three, is your facility willing to deliver medically monitored intensive residential services for any individual with medical for 3.7 pH physical health or emotional behavioral conditions for 3.7 MH mental health severe enough to warrant 24 seven care, but who do not need acute hospitalization. If your facility can answer these three items affirmatively, then as a provider, you should maintain the preliminary designation and wait for the confirmation process to be developed and announced by DDAP DHS prior to the full implementation date of July 1, 2021. DDAP anticipates additional conversations with providers and stakeholders and opportunities for clarification as we move forward. DDAP and DDAP DHS will be announcing a self-exclusion process in the very near future so that those providers who have been preliminarily designated as a 3.7 level of care, but who no longer can or want to provide the service based on the information in the documents and in this presentation can withdraw their designation. So please watch both agencies listservs for this information to be relayed. Otherwise, DDAP and DHS will need to confirm a provider's capacity to deliver the 3.7 services. The process for this will be determined in the coming months. However, those providers that feel confident by way of the self-assessment and through aligning with the expectations described in this presentation and the 3.7 documentation should continue to move forward with preparations for becoming fully recognized as a 3.7 provider of services. Again, DDAP will keep the field abreast of the considerations for any adjustments necessary in providing this level of care, including rates, and will engage in discussions moving forward. So regarding the Pennsylvania specific expectations in the very few minutes and maybe a, a 
few extra. Uh, I just want to run through um, a couple of slides regarding the Pennsylvania specific expectations that are noted in the addendum. Regarding the clinical staffing requirements, DDAP embraces the rich heritage of lived experience that has held a long presence in our treatment field. But we also acknowledge the benefit of licensed clinicians as described in the ACM criteria. By striking a balance of education and training that can be acquired through the certification process, we will continue to have a gateway for those in recovery or those who do not have graduate degrees to gain experience through a mentoring process will at the same time more fully embrace the credentialing process that already exists in the state through the Pennsylvania Certification Board. Staff hired prior to July 1, 2021 will not have to meet the requirement as long as they remain with the same SUD employer. However, if an employee hired prior to July 1, 2021 seeks employment with a new SUD provider, they will need to become certified under the protocol for new hires outlined in the addendum document. New hires after July 1, 2021 will have one year beyond meeting PCB requirements to obtain certification. Therefore, depending on the type of certification, level of education and experience, this expectation should be met between one and four years after hiring. Regarding the motivational enhancement strategies uh, and stages of change, because appropriate use of the ACM criteria is reliant upon a working knowledge of the stages of change and motivational interviewing, all assessors and clinicians should have an immediate foundational awareness of this information. This can be obtained through any number of self selected online trainings, and there are a lot of them out there um, through ATTC, you can research online, um, through independent reading, facility in-house guidance and instruction, etc. A record of how this foundational awareness was obtained should be maintained in each employee's training file. However, if formal DDAP approved MI training has not been completed, has not been completed prior to July 1st, 2021, staff will need to obtain this training over an incremental time period. Clinical supervisors are expected to have DDAP approved MI training by July 1st, 2023. So there are several years to obtain that training and all other clinical staff are expected to have the training by July 1st, 2026. After 2026, all new clinical staff will be expected to have MI training within 18 months of hire if DDAP approved training was not previously obtained. Assessments should be done independently of the provider delivering the treatment service. In cases where that cannot occur, there must be evidence of neutrality with validation by the SCA. More guidance will be issued on this requirement moving forward, but it is anticipated um, that this is uh, going to be incorporated in the SCA monitoring cycle beginning February 2021. Um, so more to come on that piece. And in closing, DDAP would like to remind everyone that alignment with the service descriptions continues to be a process in which we will offer as much support as possible. Please review the slide presentation and the written documentation available on DDAP's website about service alignment, including the timeline. And again, uh, the presentation and the slide deck um, should be available by late next week, hopefully. Uh, the timeline should be uh, coming soon. Um, and that will help to know when completion and accountability for alignment is anticipated to occur. And in closing, I want to remind everyone that questions regarding this presentation should be submitted between now and July 20th. 
That doesn't mean if you have a question after July 20th, we won't answer it. It's just that in order for them to be incorporated in the FAQ and the follow-up presentations that we will be doing by WebEx, uh, we need them by that date to include them in the material. So um, please uh, include them in the email address noted on the slide, which is, I'll read it for those of you who are on the phone, ra dash D A A S A M at PA.gov. Again, that's R A dash D A A S A M at PA.gov and submit those questions by July 20th. Also, note that DDAP will be meeting with various provider associations during this rollout period for in-person discussions to further facilitate this stage of the ASAM alignment process. So we're doing more than just these WebEx uh, presentations. The question and answer WebEx presentations for the level three uh, services of care will be held on July 27th and July 28th. And the FAQ will be posted on DDAP's website around that time as well. Please see the ASAM rollout WebEx schedule for specific times and call in or Skype link details. And also, just as a reminder, each session is the same thing, so you don't need to call in to both sessions, just uh, either date July 27th or July 28th will have the same information. Also, as a reminder, if you signed into today's presentation late and did not, put your name, the name of your agency and location in the chat box as an attendee. We ask that you please do so, so that we have an idea of who attended the presentation today. That would be very helpful. Please do so before signing off of the presentation today. Otherwise, we thank you very much for being with us. For those of you who joined by phone, who um, don't have the capacity to do that by chat, Please send that into that email address, uh, your name and uh, affiliation, so that we have record of who attended. Thank you very much.